He's the shadow in the moon at night. Everyone scream. It's our town of Halloween. Or something like that. Anyway, how strong is Oogie Boogie? Oogie Boogie is the I struggle to say antagonist. I guess the deuteragonist of the Nightmare Before Christmas movie franchise. What does that mean? Ha! <laughs> words. Google it, mate. In the sense of writing, a protagonist is the hero. We meet again, protagonist. Usually an underdog who rises up against the antagonist, who is the character causing, like, the bad things to happen. A deuteragonist is a secondary character, one that doesn't really affect the overall story as much as the protagonist or antagonist, but it's still a very important character. Think... Pikachu from the Pokemon anime. Pikachu is very prominent, but you wouldn't say that he's the main character, because that would be Ash. Jack is both the protagonist and antagonist of the Nightmare Before Christmas movie. His ambition and short-sightedness see him take over a holiday that wasn't his own, until he realizes his mistake and course corrects at the last minute. Oogie Boogie is not really needed for the overall story, but seems to have been added in just to give the film a more climactic ending. In fact, we know this because the original poem that this movie is based on ends very differently. Right when Jack is shot down by the military and lands on the stone cross in the cemetery, he meets Santa right there. Per the poem, Jack pulled himself up on a large stone cross and from there he reviewed his incredible loss. I thought I could be Santa. I had such belief. Jack was confused and filled with great grief. Not knowing where to turn, he looked toward the sky, then he slumped on the grave and he started to cry. And as Zero and Jack Jackly crumpled on the ground, they suddenly heard a familiar sound. My dear Jack, said Santa, I applaud your intent. I know wrecking such havoc was not what you meant, and so you are sad and feeling quite blue, but taking over Christmas was the wrong thing to do. I hope you realize Halloween's the right place for you. There's a lot more Jack that I'd like to say, but now I must hurry, for it's almost Christmas Day. Then he jumped in his sleigh, and with a wink of an eye, he said, Merry Christmas and he bid them goodbye. It doesn't seem very action-packed now, does it? So the movie needed something special near the end, something to really put it all together before it unraveled at the seams. Oogie Boogie's conception is one of necessity, and his character grows beyond that scope with every new facet of his being. Chapter 1, The Making of a Monster. The entire molding process. Um, after they make a mold, they then lay steel armature in the mold, the mold gets injected with a foam latex material that covers the armature. Um, it's then baked out in an oven, taken out of the mold, and brought up to fabrication. From that point on, that puppet belongs to myself and my crew. So working backwards from that point, this character is rather unique. From a writing standpoint, Oogie Boogie needs to exist at the end of the movie. We need a reason for the main characters to confront him in a battle. And then we need a way for him to be defeated and for this whole action scene to fit into the story between the poor Jack song and the ending where Santa gives presents to the children. So how do we fit him in? This is a really unique writing challenge and it involves some clever workarounds. For example, based on the poem, we know the basic story beats. The trick-or-treaters kidnap Santa and then Santa shows up at the end. So there's this bit near the middle where he's sort of like unaccounted for. And since we need we need Santa right after the confrontation, and we need a reason for Jack to fight a bad guy at the end. Well, that's just convenient, isn't it? But Jack can't just fight the trick-or-treaters, so they need to be working for someone else. This someone else has to be as prolific in Halloween folklore as pumpkins, which is a challenge. I think the boogeyman is a pretty good villain. Then you throw in some foreshadowing during the opening overture, and boom, a villain in the story, and it looks like he was meant to be there from the start. Because we know that Oogie Boogie didn't have much of a role to play in the story, it makes sense that he doesn't really do all that much in the movie itself. He kind of tortures Santa, sings about gambling, and then fights Jack before being defeated. He kind of just lives in the underground casino, which doesn't have much to do with Halloween. And he seems to be filled with bugs? Or maybe he is bugs. Attack his weak point for massive damage, dehumanize him more than any of the other characters, and then have Santa strike a finishing blow while also not seeming too violent. Seems simple enough. So how strong is Oogie Boogie? Using the conventional Care Bear stats, I, I, no, 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 hang on. There's way more to this character. Well, The Nightmare Before Christmas came out in 1993. Since then, Disney has been adding to the franchise because it sells out a ton of merchandise. Let's skip like a dozen years into the future and really start breaking this down. Chapter 2. The Video Games. In 2005, two video games came out at the same time. Uh, a little side note, uh, the... <laughs> 
The PS2 game came out in 2004 in Japan, but it came out in America in 2005 to coincide with the Game Boy Advance release. Not really sure why, and it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but when I wrote the script, I was like, oh, 2005, they both came out at the same time. So we're just, we're just gonna go with that and pretend like I didn't mess that up. Two video games came out at the same time. Nightmare Before Christmas, The Pumpkin King for Game Boy Advance, and Nightmare Before Christmas, Oogie's Revenge on the PS2. The former, a prequel, and the latter, a sequel. Let's talk about those, because they both greatly expand on the character of Oogie Boogie. Now that the character is in the store and everybody loved him, it's time to expand the merchandise section. In Nightmare Before Christmas, the Pumpkin King. We go back to about a year before the events of the movie. Here, Oogie is now immigrating to Halloween Town with his bugs, and it occurs to me that uh, there might be people watching this video who might not know the premise of the movie, so real quick. Sally, you shouldn't be here. It's dangerous. I had to warn you. Oogie's headed for the hinterlands. I have a bad feeling more trouble is waiting for you down this path. There's this forest called the Hinterlands with different trees, and each tree has a different holiday the door. door. Christmas Town. The spooks of Halloween can get so tiresome year after year. I wanted something new, and I found this. Beyond this door is a world filled with wonders, the likes of which you've never seen. At first, I couldn't believe my eyes. If you open Everything these holiday so doors, you can go through the tree and land in that other Just holiday realm. For example, Halloween Town or Christmas Town, but presumably there's also an Easter Town, Thanksgiving Town, etc. Oogie Boogie is not from Halloween Town originally. Oogie Boogie had his own holiday, Bug Day, in August. Bug Day is not celebrated anymore, so Oogie decided to go to Halloween Town. This idea that a holiday can stop being celebrated and that the door would uh, disappear is like a weird thing to think about for the individuals living in that realm. Kind of like in uh, Wreck-It Ralph, when a game is unplugged and it means all the characters in that game might die. Do they try to evacuate them into one of the other holidays? What if one gets stuck inside? Do they die forever? Are they alive at all or just a construct of human imagination? <laughs> right, so anyway, Oogie Boogie enters Halloween Town, possibly in reference to the fact that he was not originally part of the poem, <laughs> and then he decides he wants to take it over. His plan is to take over Halloween and rename it crawl ween because bugs crawl around a little Kafka-esque. I might go over your head. Okay. Why is that funny? Uh, because she's touching the meat? No. It is a satire of people who say Kafka-esque when a situation is not Kafka-esque. Well, it would be funnier if the caption said, please, no meat touching, man. You see, they're bugs, so... In this game, Jack has just obtained the title of Pumpkin King, which allows him to go into the real world on Halloween to scare children, as is their custom. Oogie goes out of his way to try to take his powers for himself, as well as to take over the whole holiday. Uh, he keeps flip-flopping if you'll call it Crawloween or Bug Day, but like, like his whole shtick is he's just Turbo from Wreck-It Ralph. He breaks into a different world and tries to take control of it all for himself. The, the main difference is after fighting him three times, Jack exiles him to his underground lair and forbids him from joining in on the holiday festivities. Oogie claims that he'll be back, and next time it'll be a real nightmare! Do you get it? Because nightmare before Christmas! The other video game, Oogie's Revenge, shows Oogie getting revenge. Wild. Jack returns from his Pumpkin King duties in the real world, only to find that things are not quite right back in Halloween Town, where it seems Dr. Finkelstein has taken over and built a bunch of robots. Luckily, Jack is armed with his trusty Soul Robber. I call it the Soul Robber. Amazing. I'm sure it will come in handy. Soul Robber. Soul Robber. Soul Robber. That's it, that's the game. You use the soul robber. Nah, but okay, so Oogie Boogie has replaced Finkelstein's brain with a new one he can control and is probably up to his old Crawloween tricks again. I have to switch the doctor's real brain back to save him. Let's see. If I open his head from behind, then get in front of him and throw his real brain in... Yes! That should work! He's stealing the holiday doors from the woods, from the, from the hinterlands. Hinterlands. Doctor! The St. Patrick's Day door! 
Indeed, that is a holiday door. Hmm. He's using their energies to supercharge his own power. He also seems to be going on an attempted regicide spree, planning to kill the kings of every holiday until he's the only one left. We also learn that he can control and manipulate his own shadow into fighting as a boss battle, giving new meaning to shadow boxing, but also in a fun twist on this shadow on the moon at night in the movie. Just add that out to his list of abilities at the end, I guess. Speaking of abilities, though, after breaking into Christmas Town and trying to kill Santa, who, by the way, we learn as uh, the king of Christmas Town, I just thought it for a bad one in there. And he ends up falling onto a holiday trash hill, which allows him to absorb all the holiday magics and allow him to become his seven holidays king form. Is this a trick? I'm not impressed. You're bad and now you're tall. It makes it all the more worthwhile to see a giant fall. Plenty left to do. I fought your most unwelcome help, and now I'm after you! Even if you catch me, you can never be here again. I'll take stories high and just a storm, which means I'm going to win. It's over! You're finished! You'll never get away! You, the Seven Holidays King? That'll be the day! How feeble, how childish, is that the best you got? Seven Holidays King! You're king of nothing! This form has the combined aspects of Halloween, Christmas, Easter, Valentine's, St. Patrick's, Thanksgiving, and Fourth of July days. Uh, this game seems kind of uh, America-centric, but this, this form seems weird. So, like, it came out in Japan first, and why would Japan celebrate Fourth of July or Thanksgiving, you know? It's like, why would you put it out in Japan first? Chapter 3, Seven Holidays King Form. Uh, quick aside, there's this book that released in like uh, 2022, Long Live the Pumpkin Queen by uh, Shia Earnshaw. This book focuses on Sally as the main character, finally living together with Jack, but feeling as if she doesn't quite fit into the world around her. When a sleeping spell makes everyone else in Halloween Town fall asleep, Sally goes into the woods to investigate and wanders through a lot of different holiday realms. This is our only real glimpse at some of these different holiday towns, but they're just description is about what you would expect. Uh, Easter Town is full of pastel eggs, plastic grass, and we really see its king in the movie. Valentineville is just full of love. And St. Patrick's Day Town is the only town with a pub because of, of, of course it is, you know? Sally herself is actually from Dreamtown, but was kidnapped as an infant and Let raised go. by Dr. Finkelstein, who removed her cotton stuffing and replaced it with dead leaves to keep her from leaving, repeatedly mutilating her and having her stitch herself back together, okay? Uh, we learn that there are still doors to these long forgotten holidays like Dreamtown and other areas, but that these main seven holidays in the center are the ones that get the most attention. So it's entirely possible that Oogie Boogie lied when he said Bugtown didn't exist anymore. He just wanted all the powers of the main seven holidays to himself. What are those powers anyway? Chapter 4 Powers and Abilities Aside from his vacuum roar, which allows Oogie to suck in anything nearby, Oogie shows the innate ability to control his bugs individually as well as Finkelstein's brain. He can control his shadow from a very large distance, even putting the shadow into an identical sack to the one he he normally wears, uh, resulting in the ability to essentially he, he could be in multiple locations at once. His various casino items are all apparently custom made, putting him at a gadgeteer class of character. The weaponry is mostly obstacle based, rotating around a large roulette wheel for example, his playing cards use bladed weaponry in a choreographed motion. The slot soldiers use guns but fire in short bursts before retreating. He also has exploding dice. The neon skeletons in the casino are either victims of his cannibalism or possibly constructs designed to unnerve his next victim. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention the cannibalism. I always forget about the cannibalism. In the Trick or Treater song Kidnap the Santa Claus, they mention that they give Oogie sacrifices to stay on his good side. They toss bugs or other victims down a series of pipes leading to Oogie Boogie's casino where he's kept in exile. 
They mentioned that if they were on his boogie list, they'd run out of town, implying he has a list of people he doesn't like. Very few people seem to enter his casino area and live to talk about it, and they also mentioned that he sometimes rewards them with snake and spider stew or other special brews. All of these facts in conjunction to the multitude of skeletons down there seem to imply that Oogie Boogie eats whatever they give him, even and especially if what they give him is a living person. In that sense, seeing him torture Santa is more like, hey, it's like watching somebody play with their food. Despite this, Tim Burton says Oogie Boogie is not an evil character. But uh, of course, Tim Burton says a lot of things, so you know, take that, take, take what you will. Regardless, he has a bunch of skeletons. Honestly, for someone with such an inherently low amount of luck, having all of his weaponry based on gambling seems out of place. But then we also see him slam the table to change the results of his dice rolls. He kind of makes his own luck. His seven holidays king form seems to take different innate abilities from the different holiday leaders. We know from the game what a few of these powers are, with Jack switching different outfits for different power-ups. Jack uses his soul robber during most of the gameplay, but as the holiday leader for Halloween Town, Jack gets his Pumpkin King costume, which allows him brief control over pyromancy, able to summon short-lived fires for destructive combat. In Pumpkin King for Game Boy, the Pumpkin King form gives Jack temporary invincibility and the ability to defeat any enemy in one hit, though this is powered by one of Helgamine's potions. It may not actually be inherent to the form itself. In addition, his Christmas outfit gives him the ability to pull presents out of a sack in order to throw them at his enemies. And presumably Santa also has this present power? When he's delivering the presents in the real world. The power isn't so much the presents themselves, as we see them being assembled by elves, but it seems to be the ability to summon things out of the sack, like a bag of holding. Which, in retrospect, yeah, it seems especially powerful when one remembers that Oogie Boogie is himself a giant sack with the ability to vacuum in large amounts of items to begin with. Honestly, that's a pretty good power. From Long Live the Pumpkin Queen, we know that the leader of Valentine's Day is Ruby Valentino. She's described as being a foot taller than Jack and, uh, not not much else. I don't really know what power she might possess that he would want. There's an alternate sequence from the movie that would suggest that Valentinsville has these fat cupids that dip arrows in chocolate and shoot targets, so presumably something to do with archery or love? She rents cottages in Valentinsville, so maybe she just runs bed and breakfasts. Likewise, the Easter Bunny doesn't seem to have any innate abilities beyond, like, hiding eggs. Uh, like, Sally comes from Dreamtown and seems to be able to have prophetic dreams of the future because of this, but he doesn't really call himself all holidays king, just seven, so we can't count that. What else do we have? Say Patrick's Day Town is noted as having a pup? It prob probably has lots of leprechauns, but also, like, okay. Say Patrick was a real guy. He's a real guy in Irish history, a Catholic missionary from Britain, famous for driving the snakes out of Ireland in the 5th century. I'm gonna have to stop you right there, Father, because I know for a fact that there were never any snakes in Ireland, and St. Patrick didn't drive anything out of anywhere. During a fast in the mountains, it is said that snakes attacked the saint in question, who were then banished into the seas, never to return to Ireland ever again. I mean, historians beg to differ with this claim considering Ireland never really had any snakes to begin with. It's a coastal climate, it would not be a good fit to their specific zoological requirements. In the 5th century, the term snakes could also be applied to a person of a treacherous nature, a person aligned with Satan, or really anyone that may have been unaligned to the Catholic worldview. This isn't to say that the story could have been changed or someone whitewashed with the idea that St. Patrick uh, allegedly. I've been told I need to make sure this is all my own conjecture. However, this is not not to say that the story could have been changed or somewhat whitewashed with the idea that St. Patrick threw a bunch of undesirable people of a different faith or outlook off of a cliff, Highlander style. And then later, maybe he told his followers that he drove out the snakes as a bit of hyperbole, only for it to be taken literally later on. However, while St. Patrick's exact lifespan isn't known, it's well documented to be during the 5th century, somewhere between 400 and 500 AD, that he moved to Ireland from Britain, and that the only clear documentation we have of Ireland before that period of time is kind of still being reconstructed. 
Britain has a history of sending large scathes of people all over the world who don't really treat the indigenous people very well upon their arrival. It's many of these British crews commenting that the people in these new lands are savages or akin to animals. I, I seriously, I wonder how many Irish people are actually watching this video and... Okay, we're just gonna move on. Thanksgiving! I don't know. Remember when I just said that people from Britain went to other parts of the world and didn't really treat the indigenous people there with very much respect? This one we kind of do have a concrete history on because it's a lot more recent. Uh, Thanksgiving Town also shows up in Long Live the Pumpkin Queen, and the only denizens are described as wearing buckle hats, and, uh, it's kind of as politically correct as the book could really be about in the manner. They, they eat food. Big feasts. Let's not talk about the Trail of Tears or how America still treats indigenous people, okay? I guess Oogie Boogie gets the power of overeating, which, again, it kind of mixes with the vacuum breath and Santa sack. But let's move on! I really don't want to talk more about politics. This is supposed to be a part of fucking cartoon character. What's next, Holly? Independence Day Town! You know what? We're just gonna move on to stats. Chapter 5. Stats. We're gonna be using the conventional Care Bear stat system because I still have that file sitting around. It's been a few years. Caring. 10. Caring is not strictly about empathy. It can also mean conviction. While Oogie Boogie may not care about other people as much as you or me, uh, he, he does care an awful lot about himself. His ambition may come from a desire to make a name for himself or to return Bug Day slash Crawloween to the calendars in the real world, but his devotion towards furthering these goals shows that he does care a great deal for them. Considering that the holiday doors of the hinterlands only reveal themselves to Jack after he sings his laments and yearns for something more. Uh, hinterlands is actually a Germanic word in origin. It means either an uncharted area of great import or export, or otherwise a place or land beyond the land we know, free of human contact. Think literally that backrooms meme? Oogie Boogie cares so much about his ideals he's able to control the back rooms and take the holiday doors off the hinges. Billy Badge 2. In his 7 holiday king form he has like a little heart on his tummy. It's adorable. Speed 6. Oogie Boogie is a trick or treat sack full of bugs. A lumbering shamble of a man. And while he can jump around and sing he's not especially nimble on his stitched together feet. However he doesn't really need to be because he can literally be in two places at once. While in full control of both consciousness enough to have the full faculty of singing and fighting while also simultaneously venturing uncharted land and committing grand theft slay i mean yeah the slay crashes but like he still flew it while singing and dancing in an entire different country are they are they countries towns straight 10 oogie boogie would already have a pretty high strength stat able to effortlessly pick up santa claus who must weigh i don't know at least 250 to 300 pounds with one hand while taunting him but in his giant form he would be pretty much unstoppable if only wasn't being held back by his own hubris. Jump 3. I can't tell really if I'm being stingy or generous with this number, but it, it just it feels right to me. Oogie Boogie is able to jump around while singing, but only for short distances, and he seems to have to rest in between doing that. Hero is in 5. Tim Burton says he's not evil, so I'm putting him right in the middle. Maybe in his own twisted way, trying to share Bug Day with the world would have helped humanity, and, and we didn't even know it. Did you know that there actually is a National Bug Day in the United States? Based on having Thanksgiving and Independence Day, I think it's fair to say these plans mostly involve the United States. National Be Kind to Bugs Day is on July 14th, created by Kiana Monson in 2021. It it's a day where we should all remember that bugs don't need to be mistreated. Maybe you can celebrate this year by making arts and crafts projects related to insects or spiders. Go on into nature, see what kind of bugs you can find, and just generally... Be <laughs>